Hi everyone, we are beginning chapter 8 of our AP Statistics unit. Guys, this is one of my favorite chapters. Um, we're talking about confidence intervals. Confidence intervals. So here is Garfield to introduce it for us. Uh, taking a look at tomorrow's weather, the high temperature will be between 40 below zero and 200 above. This guy's never wrong. Well, probably not, but let's see if we can get a bit more specific, shall we? After this first section where we just learned about the basics, we're going to know how to interpret both a confidence level and a confidence interval. We're going to describe how it gives a range of plausible values. We're going to talk about the conditions that are going to be necessary if we want to construct confidence intervals. And then um, talk about practical issues that can affect the interpretation. So this is a really big transition. In this last chapter, in chapter 7, we assumed that we knew the true value of the parameter, right? We assumed we knew p, we assumed we knew mu, the population mean. And then we asked questions about the distribution of the statistic used to estimate that parameter. But now, we no longer pretend to know the true value. We're going to start with a more realistic situation where we know only the value of a statistic, right, from a sample, and then use that to estimate the value of a parameter. So where's a good place to start? A point estimator, right? That's going to be a statistic that provides an estimate of a population parameter. So the point estimate is going to be the value of that statistic from a sample. Ideally, it's our best guess at the value of an unknown parameter. So the point estimator can be a potential mean, standard deviation, IQR, median, whatever you want to know about. Okay? Now, Chances are that the point estimate isn't exact, right? Hence the name, estimate. So in order to be more exact, we would find an interval of possible values for this unknown parameter. So let's talk a little bit more about point estimators. We have two examples. A golf ball manufacturer would also like to investigate the variability of the distance traveled by the golf balls by estimating the interquartile range. The math department for B wants to know what proportion of its students own a graphing calculator. So they take a random sample of 100 students and find that 28 own a graphing calculator. So what would be the point estimators here? Well, in A, we want to figure out the true IQR. So the best place to start would be the sample IQR. For B, if we want to know the population proportion, the best place to start would be the sample proportion, p hat, okay? In this case, that p hat equals 0.28. So best estimate for p is p hat of 0.28. So if you want to know something about the population parameter, start with the sample statistic. All right, lots of important information here. Very, 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 very important. So many stars should go around this, highlight this, put a box around it. This is important information. If I have a confidence level, right? Some people say, oh, I'm, you know, 20% confident or I'm 100% confident. We'll never say 100%. Um, the confidence level is going to be the success rate of the method for calculating the interval, right? It tells us how likely it is that the method we're using will produce an interval that captures the population perimeter if we were to use that method many times. Okay, so if you wanted to interpret a particular confidence level, you could say if many samples of the same size are taken, about whatever percent it is of the intervals constructed would contain the true whatever, the true population proportion of teens who own cell phones, the true um, population mean of the average number of dogs per household. I don't know, lots of different things. You can interpret a confidence level without actually knowing the interval, okay? Now, please, please, please note this. This is not a probability. It's not telling us the chance that the interval will contain the true population parameter, okay? So there should be no, there's a 95% chance. No, stop there. It's, if I were to do this, about that percent of the intervals would have it, all right? And I'll show you a visual here in a little bit about what it means. So, another example, in 95% of all possible samples of the same size, the resulting confidence interval would capture the true yada, 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 yada. 
Okay. Um, this is a good sentence uh, starter to memorize. Okay. If we're interpreting the level. Now, say you want to interpret an interval, okay? Well, what is this confidence interval that I'm talking about? So it really has two parts, right? It has the actual interval itself, and then, then there's the level, okay? So the interval is calculated with two pieces of information. You start with the estimate, right, the point estimate that we already talked about. And then you're add, adding and subtracting this margin of error, okay? So the interval gives you an interval of plausible values, right, things we wouldn't be surprised if it were true, for a parameter, and then the margin of error is going to be how close the estimate tends to be to the unknown parameter through repeated sampling. Okay. Um, sometimes in news articles they'll talk about the margin of error like, oh, it's this percentage with a margin of error of 3%. So more or less it's within 3% above or below. That's what we think. If we're interpreting the confidence interval, all right, so not the level like the last one, but the interval. We would say we are whatever percent confident that the interval from blank to blank, whatever those numbers were calculated to be, contains, or you could say it captures the true, insert the parameter details here. Okay, so here's an example. We are 95% confident that the interval from 3.03 inches to 3.35 inches captures the actual mean amount of rain in the month of April in Miami. So, a couple things that are included, the percentage, the actual interval values, and then the context. All right, we're going to do so much practice with these, you'll be able to do it in your sleep. Now, the general formula. This section, we're not actually going to be calculating the intervals themselves. Um, those will be the next two sections. One section will be confidence means, or intervals for um, population means, and one will be intervals for population proportions. But the general formula is the same regardless if it's for means or for proportions. You start with your point estimate, your statistic, and then you're adding and subtracting your margin of error. Margin of error is made up of two parts. The critical value, which is like a z-score, and then your standard deviation of your statistic. And again, there's going to be formulas for this later, but I just want to show you what the general idea of it is. So let's look at an example. According to a Gallup poll published on January 9th, 2013, a 95% confidence interval for the true proportion of American adults who support the death penalty is 63% plus or minus 4%, so give or take 4%. That 4% is your margin of error. Okay, this 63% was my point estimate. Okay, so that's like my p-hat. This estimate was based on a random sample of 1,038 American adults. Interpret the interval in context. Interpret the interval in context. All right. We would say that we are 95% confident that the interval from 59% to 67% contains the true percentage of all Americans who support the death penalty. Now, what are the important parts here? We have the um, level, the 95% confidence. We have the actual interval, 59 to 67. Where did that come from? Well, my point estimate was 63%, so I added and subtracted the margin of error, 4%. And then I have the context, true percentage, or you could have said true proportion of all Americans who support the death penalty. Okay? Now that's interpreting the interval, not the level. So here's a good visual. We're going to look at this applet later. Um, these are lots of confidence intervals that have been calculated, all right? If your true value of the population mean is here at mu, the red dot signifies the point estimate, and then the green line is the interval. You can see that most of these intervals contain this value of the population mean, except for this one right here. That's why we say we are 90, you know, if we were to do this many, 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 many times, about whatever percentage, that's how many intervals would actually contain it. Okay? So there's a visual of what confidence intervals are. So why is it 95% instead of 100%? Well, if we were 100% sure, then we'd say there is a mean. Or there is a proportion, the proportion of people who own cell phones is somewhere between 
<coughs> excuse me, 0% and 100%. That doesn't really help us too much. So we want to be sure, but without being overly sure, as in including way too many values, right? Because then it's just going to be, why would you even bother doing the math? Um, page 475 of your textbook has some really good thoughts there. Um, some of those include the fact that the confidence level is not the chance that the confidence interval captures the parameter. Right? I said that before and I'll say it again. It's not the chance. Also, the confidence interval gives us plausible values of the parameter. So we wouldn't be surprised if any of those values actually turned out to be the truth. All right, another example. According to a Gallup poll, uh, back in 2010, 95% confidence interval for the true proportion of Americans who approved the job Barack Obama was doing as president was 0.44 um, plus or minus 0.03. So 44% was my p hat, give or take a margin of error of 3%. Interpret both the level, confidence level, and the confidence interval. Okay. So interpreting the confidence level. If many samples are taken, about 95% of the intervals constructed would contain the true proportion of Americans who approve Obama's presidency. So notice how I'm just saying, if many samples are taken. And I don't have the 44% or the 3% anywhere in this. You don't need to include those when you're interpreting the level. But you do include those when you're interpreting the interval, right? We are 95% confident that the interval from 41% to 47% captures the true proportion of Americans who approve of Obama's presidency or who approve of the job he was doing, right? Context. All right, let's see if we can wrap this up. We have an example here. You can take a moment and pause and read that on your own. We're talking about the steps employees take per day on a pedometer. Uh, we want to interpret confidence level, confidence interval, figure out what was the point estimate, what was the margin of error, and then is there convincing evidence that they're not meeting the guidelines? So let's start at the top, confidence level. If we were to take many samples of size 50 and you were to calculate many intervals, about 95% of those will include the true average number of steps per day for those employees. So notice how I don't actually include what the interval is. That comes here when we interpret the interval. We are 95% confident that the interval from 45-47 steps to 84-73 steps, notice again, using context here, I said steps, contains the true average number, or I could say the true mean number of steps per day for employees. Now, point estimate, margin of error. Well, the point estimate is going to be in the middle of that interval, right? So you basically just average the endpoints to figure out that the point estimate was 65.10. That was my sample um, mean, my X bar. Margin of error is going to be how far it is from that point estimate to one of the endpoints. So once you know that point estimate, just figure out the distance, aka the difference, between one of the endpoints of my interval and the point estimate in the middle. Evidence of not meeting the guideline. So since our guideline was to, you know, be 10,000 steps, which is so many steps, since I want to have 10,000 steps and my values went from, what, 45, 47 to 84, 73, it seems pretty convincing that the employees on average are not meeting this guideline. Okay? So here is one more example. And, um, and here in a second, I'm going to show the answers to this, but I would really like for you to try this on your own. Okay? Uh, the next video is going to contain some of the conditions that need to be done in order to complete confidence intervals. So here are the answers to that last one. Try it on your own, though, before you just copy it down. And we'll talk more in the next video.